If you have ever collected data using paper forms, you know the hassle. You know how difficult it is to make sure that the data is of high quality and you know how much money and time you spend just trying to get that data into a computer. This is why people have now developed methods of collecting data using mobile devices. They are easy, they are cheap and they are very convenient and very fast as well. Now in this course, we are going to be talking about how you can build yourself mobile data collection solutions using a software known as Cobo Toolbox. Cobo Toolbox is a, is a web-based platform where you can just go in, create your account and it's free of charge and you develop forms and deploy them on mobile devices. The data that you collect is available anywhere at any time that you want it on the internet. And this poses a lot of advantages than paper forms because now you can collect data in real time. You don't have to wait for people to get that data and enter it into a computer. Once the data has been entered and once the data has been sent over to the, to the server, then you can access that data at any point. Oh, did I also mention that you have the ability to collect your data offline and synchronize it whenever you have some internet? Now, in this course, I'm going to walk you through the whole process of developing a mobile data collection uh, forms in Cobo Toolbox. And then we'll see how you can actually get that forms on your mobile devices, collect data, send them back into the server so that they can be aggregated. And once the data has been aggregated, you'll be able to now access it, view it, download it in as many formats as you want and, and analyze it in other programs, for example, Microsoft Excel. If you're ready, let's get started. So we're going to kick up the course by starting with showing you how you can create an account on cobo2box.org. Let's get started. So the first thing you want to do is open your web browser. I have mine open here, Firefox. And you go on the address bar at the top and say cobo2box.org and press enter. Right, at this point, all we have to do is wait. Depending on the speed of your internet, we should have it open right about now. Great. Okay, so it says simple, robust, and powerful tools for data collection. Exactly what we came here for. So what you want to do is go ahead and click the sign up button at the top. And you're basically, you're presented with two options. If you are creating this account for an organization, then I would very much recommend that you use the option on the right hand side that is unlimited use for humanitarian organizations. Now, if you're just a researcher, like an individual, of which this will basically fit most of us uh, watching this course, or taking this course, I would say go ahead and uh, use the server on your right hand side. So you go ahead and say create an account all right, so now we have the uh, form that we can use to create our account. So what you want to do is go ahead and say, okay, my name is Alexander um, Tembe Nuzani, organization Unique Multimedia, and my username is A Tembe Nuzani. Now, when you're filling in the username, need to make sure that it's all lowercase letters and without spaces. I very much recommend just using the format I've used here, my first name followed um, by my surname like this for the username. And make sure that you plug in uh, your, all right, your uh, address and um, you go ahead and select the sector. So let's say environment, the country, uh, my country is Malawi and um, I am obviously male and then you go ahead and type your password all right and confirm the password by repeating it here and you go ahead and create an account now I'm not going to create an account because I already actually have an account so I'm just gonna go ahead and log in but when you actually create um, click create an account is going to send a, conf um, a confirmation email to your email address and um, you would have to go and log into your email address click on link so make sure you read the email it's gonna provide you a link that you click and then you go back it actually logs you in directly I'm just gonna go ahead and um, go to my um, to the login 
and I'm gonna go ahead and uh, log into my account because I already have my account and my account is um, that and uh, with my password and I go ahead and log in let's see if logs in logs me in this uh, is a particular perfect now when you log in for the first time after just creating your account you are probably not going to have any project so you can see here i have lots of different projects that i use to teach others and others that i actually use to collect some data as you can see you're not going to have anything it's actually going to say you have nothing you want to go ahead and cre uh, create your first project so in the next lesson we're going to talk about how you create your first project and how you actually get started by uh, adding your questions and so on in the last lesson, we created an account on Kobo 2 Box platform. In this lesson, I'm going to show you how we actually start um, creating the project. So to create a project, we're going to go ahead and uh, basically just go ahead and click the new button. And we are presented with four, with four options. The first option is building from scratch, which is an option that we're going to be using 99% of the times. Um, if you have built a form and you have um, defined it as a template, then you could actually go ahead and use that um, as a template by clicking use a template and selecting that project to start off. And um, we, was, we also have two other advanced options. You can build a form using your micro, uh, Microsoft Excel. Uh, we call that XLS form and that is something that we're not going to be touching on in this course now i'm gonna go ahead and just click build from scratch and the next thing is now for us to enter the name of the project i'm just gonna call this my project the next thing is uh putting a description if you're gonna be passing this project on to other people you would want to actually go ahead and uh, add a description that talks about what this project is all about. I'm just going to say that this is my first project in Kobo 2 box. Great stuff. Then we can specify the sector for this project. Um, what is this sector about? All right, I'm just gonna say environment and the country. Once again, I'm gonna pick Malawi as my country. Um, I would very much recommend to check uh, help Cobo 2 box improve this product so that this information you have entered can be sent to the team at Cobo 2 box so that they can use it for also their reporting and their learning in terms of how they can improve upon the pro uh, the product but considering this is not a project that is actually active that is gonna uh, actually collect some legit data I'm just gonna go ahead and say create project and wait All right, so if you have this screen on your screen, then congratulations, because now you're ready to start creating your form. Let's meet again in the next lesson. We're going to talk about how to add questions. So in this lesson, we're going to talk about how you're going to add questions to your form. As you can see on the screen, it says this form is currently empty and we can add questions, notes, prompts and other fields by clicking on the plus sign below. So why don't we go ahead and actually click the plus sign. Now, based on our questionnaire that we have, our first question is going to be what is your name? So all you have to do is type what is your name and press enter then you're presented with a lot of um, wide range basically of um, uh, response types so questions can be designated as select one or select many or text or number or decimal and so on depending on what kind of response you're expecting from the respondent so the most common ones that you're going to be using are select one which we use when the questions responses have been um, are actually multiple choice and you, you expect the respondent to answer or respond one item from the list so questions like gender or marital status or high education level where you would like the person to pick one from the list of items select many adds on to that uh, in that it actually allows you to select several options from the list of options. And then there is text, which is about 
um, basically you want the respondent to give you words that you're simply gonna type on the mobile device. Number only allows you to type numbers and decimal allows you to type numbers with decimals. The difference with number is that number is for integers only and decimal allows you to actually add decimals uh, when uh, responding on that question. Now, I have supplied you with a handout that you can basically reference in terms of uh, the definitions of these capture types. So I would like to uh, encourage you to go ahead and look at that file and then you're actually going to be able to understand the differences between all these capture types. But for the question that we are dealing with at the moment, which is what is your name, the best capture type or response type, in other words, is actually going to be text. So select text and it means now I have my question on the screen. I can go ahead and save this. Let's um, actually go ahead and uh, preview. So as it's saving, I can go on, uh, uh, on this icon right here and click that for a preview. So as you can see, the preview has been generated and uh, the question is, has been dis uh, displayed and everything is perfect as we'd expect. So let's go ahead and add the other questions. A close um, preview. The next question says gender. All right, so I'll just say gender. And this question has options, male or female. And uh, from these options, a respondent can only pick one item. So that um, actually fits as a select one type of question. I'll have to now define the um, labels of male and uh, female like that. If you have more options, you can actually add the more options by clicking this option here, click to add another response. I'm just going to go ahead and click that. And you can see that we have a, another response apart from the two just that we added. If we don't need that, we can actually go ahead and delete that. And um, if you, right now you can actually see that this question has taken a lot of our space. So we can click this um, little arrow here to collapse it. You may have noticed at this point that um, these questions have um, a place where you can put a question hint. And question hint is basically some text that you want to add on the question which provides extra instruction about the question. So uh, for these questions, we don't have any extra instructions that we want to add in. So we can just leave it as so. Let's go to the next question. The next question says, how old are you? We click on the button and say, how old are you? We add that. So we're going to have the answers in years. So we can actually have to specify this as number. Now, this is the best place for us to actually add the um, the question hint and I've added question hint in years to show the person asking the questions that whatever answer that we're going to, we're going to receive from the respondent, it will have to be recorded as years. That's great. Let's continue our adding of questions. The next question says, um, are you married? So are you married? Question mark. Press enter. We have two options. We have yes or no. So a person can only pick one. So you guessed it. That would be select one. I'll select select one and specify that to be male. So rather, sorry, rather yes. And the other option to be no. All right. So let's collapse it again like that. Now, these four questions are respondent details. Now, to organize this questionnaire um, nicely so that it's easy to follow, I'm going to have to group these four questions that I've created and label the group as question, uh, uh, rather, respondent details. To do that, what you do is, first of all, click on the first question like, like this. I very much recommend you click on the icon that shows the type of question it is. So where there's ABC, for example, for text, uh, for the first question. When you click, you realize that you have a blue border surrounding the question. That shows that the question has actually been um, selected. Then you press control key on your keyboard. While pressing the control key, click the next question. Then the next question. Then the last question 
you can actually see that all questions now have a blue border around them. That means we have selected all four questions. Perfect. And the next thing we'll do is to go on the toolbar here at the top and select this icon that says create group with selected questions. And you can see that we have successfully added all the four questions to a group. The next thing we have to do is now click on the name of the group. I'm just going to double click to select it. And I'm going to say that this is respondent details. So we have successfully added questions to a group. And um, once more, we we'll actually uh, collapse the group as well so that we save space. All right, I'm going to go ahead and save this, but I'll not preview. I'll just go ahead and add the rest of the questions. So let's go ahead and add more. The next question is how many people are um, in this household? So I'm going to say that. I'm going to type that. How many people are in this household? Okay, what response type is it going to be? You guessed it right. That would be a number. Let's go to the next question. The next question says, which of the following are sources of income? So, which of the following are your households and sources of income? All right, great. And now, from the list, we have um, business, we have um, Sally, we have Peacework, and then we have other. Now, it is possible for one household to have several of these uh, items as the sources of income. Now, to do, to, for us to be able to select multiple um, items from the list, then the best capture type we can use is select many. All right. So, what are the options? We have business. We have Sally. And we have um, Peacework. And uh, lastly, we have the option Other. Now, the next thing that follows the option Other is specify Other. So what we want to do is when somebody selects business, then we call. But when somebody selects Other, they would have to specify what other um, source of income it is. So when you have an option for Other, and you need to specify a place where the person can type the other option, then we create a separate question. I'll call this specify other source of uh, income and press enter. And I'm gonna have to designate this as obviously as text because we want the person to be able to simply type on this response, uh, on this question. Now, um, before I forget, I will of course, go ahead and collapse the previous question. Now, there is obviously something that we're going to add here, which is a skip command, whereby when somebody selects anything other than other, we don't want to display, specify other source of income. But when the person actually picks other here, then that's when we want to display source of income as um, a specify other source of income so that they would be able to type in their response. All right, I go ahead and save as we go, very important. Then we go ahead and add the other section. All right, so I think we are done adding um, what are, uh, this section of household details. So we need to group this. So once again, if you remember, you click the first question, press your control key, click the second question, then the third question, then we we'll go ahead and click create group with selected questions. Great, and we're gonna Go ahead and name this household details. Great. Then we collapse the group. Don't remind, uh, don't forget to save this. Very important. Then we can go to the next question. The next question says, do you own land? All right. So I move my cursor below the group. Click the plus sign and ask, do you own land? Press enter and that's options of yes or no, and the person can only pick one from the options. So that's obviously gonna be a select one. And um, the first option is yes. The next option is no. And uh, I'm gonna have to collapse that question. Right. The next thing, uh, the next question say, specify details of each piece of land. Now this is not a question. 
We're just simply telling the respondent um, that now we want you to list down all the land holdings you have and specify the details. So it doesn't matter how many land holdings a person has, we're going to have to actually capture that. So first of all, let's add that instruction. The instruction says specify the details of um, each uh, piece of land, right? So once again, this is not a question. It's simply an instruction. So we call that a not. So I'm going to select a not for this. Then the first question within this, uh, what now what we call a roster, I'll mention in a moment. The first question is number of hectares. So we're going to go ahead and say number of hectares. Which response type is going to capture number of hectares? The best would be number? No. The best would be decimal because we expect people to actually give us a number that may contain decimals like 0 0.25 hectares. So I'm going to select decimal as a capture type. Let's go to the next one. The next one says um, type of use. Now this is a obviously a select one for each piece of land we want the person to say is this agricultural land or is this non-agricultural land. I'm going to go ahead and say select one and the first option is agricultural land and the next option is non-agricultural land. Great stuff. I will go ahead and obviously collapse this. Now this is where we now have to talk about the roster. A roster is a section of questions on a questionnaire where you would add or you would enter multiple records. Normally when you add it in Microsoft Word, it's going to be a table like you can see on our form. It's going to be a table where in the columns you have the variables and in the rows, the rows are not labeled. So you're simply going to add a lot of different um, records within that table. So you want to allow the person to enter as many records as possible. So how are we going to do that? At the moment, let me save this and preview so that I show you how this looks like. Okay, it's loaded. So if you go to the end, you see that now it says number of specify the details of each piece of land. I have to edit that. It says number of hectares and type of use, but then it means we are only going to be able to enter one piece of land. So how do we ensure that we can enter as many pieces of land as possible? The key is to repeat these questions into what is known as a roster. Close that. Um, so here, if you remember, I need to just edit them, put a C, no problem. But let's add a roster. To create a roster, you first of all have to uh, group the questions within the roster. So the questions are simply the, these two questions, this one, and then I press control key and then select the next one. Then I go ahead and click create group with selected questions. Now I'll call this group land holdings. All right. Now the key is this on the group settings. So group settings, basically this button here is for settings. If you click that button, that takes you to the behind of that group where you have two sections all group settings and skip logic. On the all group settings, you can you actually see that we have two options. Show all questions in this group on the same screen and repeat this group if necessary. The setting that we came here for is repeat this group if necessary. And that's it. I'll save this and go back to preview to show you now how this looks like. All right, let's scroll to the bottom. Now you can see that these two questions are now in a group and the group can repeat as, as evident by the minus and the plus sign that we have here. So for example, then we have a piece of land of one hectare, it's an agricultural land. Then we can click a plus to enter the second piece and so on and so forth. I'm going to show you on the mobile device how this looks like. Go ahead and close this, uh, the preview and uh, also close the settings for the group. Now. The next um, thing, before we go to the next thing, actually, I have to group these three, uh, these three things, which gets us to a conclusion or to something that I need to talk about 
that you could actually have a group inside a group. And that's what you want to do here. So the first question here, then I press my control key and select the next question. Then I select the next question, which is a group. Then I'm going to go ahead and say create group with selected questions. And this group is going to uh, be called land ownership as is in the questionnaire. Then I can actually go ahead and uh, and uh, collapse this. All right, go ahead and save this. It's very important to save as you go. The last question of our questionnaire says record the GPS for this household. I'm gonna go ahead and click the plus and type that. Great. And what capture type is that going to be? Well, if you can, if you remember on your um, on your handout, you saw that for GPS, we have point, line, and area. Considering this is just a household, it's one point on the Earth's surface, then we're going to select point as our capture type and go ahead and save this. So once we do this, it means we have been able to create our form. The next thing that we'll look at is how to define your skip logic validation criteria, and then we'll go ahead and um, deploy this form on our mobile devices. So now let's talk about skip logic. Technically, skip logic in um, Cobalt 2 box is known as relevance. Now, why is it called relevance? Because we simply control when a question will be displayed on the form. So some questions would depend on another question in whether they are going to be displayed or not. So let's take a classic example. I'm going to go ahead and expand the respondent details section and we have the question how old are you so let's suppose we find someone in the household who is age um, let's say 10 years they'll be able to respond to us but we don't want to ask if a 10 year old person is married so we are going to simply um, control whether the question are you married is going to be relevant for this person or not that's what we call a skip logic. To make it easier for you to remember this, we have two questions. The first question controls whether this other question gets displayed or not. Now, the second question is the one that we're controlling whether it's relevant to this respondent or not. So the question that gets to be controlled of whether it's going to be relevant is the one that we attach our skip logic on. In this case, how old are you is a question that controls whether we're going to ask are you married or not. And are you married is going to be asked only on a condition that how old are you is above a certain threshold. So let's say that you want to ask the question are you married only when this person said that they were um, 13 years of age or above. To do this, we go to the question are you married and add our statement of relevance. So when you go to are you married, we now switch on to skip logic section of the settings. And we go ahead and say add a condition. Right, so it says this question will only be displayed if the following conditions apply. And what are the uh, conditions? We first of all have to pick the question that controls in which case this question gets to be displayed. So in which scenario are we expecting this question, which uh, this are you married question to be um, relevant? So the question obviously is the one on top of this question, which is how old are you? So this question will only be displayed if how old are you was greater than if I click the drop down, you see you have more uh, operators that we can use. For example, if it was answered or if it was not answered regardless of the res uh, response or if it was equal to or not equal to or greater than, which is the one we have as a default. But I want it to be greater than or equal to a response value of 13. So what, I, what this means is when the question, um, how old are you, has been responded to and we have a value that is 13 or above, then this question, are you married, is going to be displayed. And if not, then it's not going to be displayed. Go ahead and save this. I think that would be, it would be great for us to preview what we have done so far. Let's see. 
right and we're gonna go ahead and um, scroll down no we're still in respondent details how old are you now one thing you'll notice is that we only have the question how old are you and the question are you married doesn't get to be displayed why because we haven't responded yet when if i put anything that is not 13 years old or more then we're not gonna end up having anything so let's say we put 15 here and press enter that's exactly when we're gonna have we're gonna see the question are you married because the condition that we have developed has been satisfied i'll close this we have more other um skip logic that we'd like to define i'm gonna close the settings of this question like so let's go to the next one so the next one where we have a skip logic is the section of land ownership i'm gonna uh, make sure that that is expanded all right, you can allow access, no problem. Um, all right, let me just close this. Right, so the question that we have is, do you own land? That's the first question that we have. And everything else from specify the details of the land up to type of use, um, all of that we would have to um, control when it's going to be displayed. Because if the person says they do not own land, then we don't want to display anything from a specified details to type of use. Now, we can go through these questions one by one, adding the relevance. Or we could simply group all the questions that depend on a certain question, in this case, do you own land? And then we add the skip logic on the group instead of having to add the skip logic on each and every individual question because that's gonna obviously take us a lot of time so how are we gonna do this i'll first of all group the question specify details of each piece of land together with the group land holdings so i click on this um, icon right here on the left hand side then i press Control key and select the group then i'll add this to a group now we have a group with the specified details of each piece of land and land holdings, I'll call this group owns land. Great, and I'm gonna collapse this so we can see it clear and nice. Great, now, this group of questions that we have created is only gonna be displayed if do you own land was answered as yes. And to do that, we'll go to the settings for the group owns land, go to skip logic, go to add a condition the f uh, this question in this case this group will be displayed if the following conditions apply and the condition is that do you own land which is the question just above this group i'm going to have to click the drop down and scroll down until i can see the question do you own land so when do you own land is equal to yes if you click the, uh, the drop down where there's equals you see other operators like if it was answered if it was not answered regardless of the response that we have been given equals or not equal to in this case we want equal sign and then on the right hand side we have all options for the question do you own land we have yes and no of which in this case we need yes so that when the question do you own land has been responded to as yes then we display this group I'm going to save this. Now, I'm not going to uh, uh, preview this yet because we have one more that we'd like to do. Remember that in the household details, we had a question of which we had option other and then we had a, uh, another question that says specify other. Let's expand household details then look at that question. So it said, which of the following are your household sources of income and expand that you see that we have business, hardly, uh, peace work, and other. Now, what I wonder is if the, when the person says other, that's only when we are going to display, specify other sources of income. Other than that, we don't want to display that question. All right, so how do we do that? We go to the settings of the question, specify other source of income, and define when that question is going to be relevant. And to do so, we go to skip logic for that question. Then I'll go to add a condition I click select question from the list and pick the question that controls whether this question will be displayed or not. In this case, which of the following are your household's sources of income? And when that question is equal to other, that's when this question is going to be displayed. I'll save this and close the settings and uh, go ahead and preview. Let's see what we have done. 
right? So, so far, we have already seen how old are you and how that affects gender, uh, rather how that affects marital status. But if you go to which of the following are your household sources of income, if I select business, I'm not going to have to specify other options. But when I say other, that's when I have to specify the other option. I hope that is really neat. I, okay. The next thing is, do you own land? If I say yes, that's when we're going to have the group owns land, which says specify other, um, the details of each piece of land and so on and so forth. So now our skip logics actually work. And um, I'm going to close this. All right. So the next thing we'll look at in the next lesson is validations. So in this lesson, we're going to talk about validation rules. Validation rules are rules that we apply on question items to basically say with which um, scenarios can we accept a value to be a valid value for that question item. This is simply adding error messages depending on whether the user has entered something that is out of a certain range um, of values that we are accepting as valid values. A classic example would be the question, how old are you? And um, I'm going to go ahead and go to the settings of that question, how old are you? At this point, we can enter anything from negative values to any value um, to 1,000, 2,000. And we would like to limit this question so that a person could enter anything less than 100 and should not go above that value. So to do that, I'm going to go to validation criteria. Then you say add a condition. And the condition says this question will be valid only if the following conditions apply. Now the condition says this question's response has to be greater than but if I click on the greater sign, I actually see that we have other um, operators that we can use. For example, we can say this question's response has to be equal to some response, or it has to be not equal to a certain response, or greater than, or less than, or equal to, and so on and so forth. So we want the value for the value for this question to only be acceptable, or to be accepted only when the value is less than or equal to 100. So everything else above 100 is not going to be accepted, but everything less or equal to 100 is going to be accepted. The last thing you need to do here is to define the error message that gets to be displayed when this rule has been violated. In this case, I'm just going to go ahead and say um, age out of range. I always like to make sure that we have a um, an error message that actually tells the user what has gone wrong. So age is out of range, which is quite self-explanatory for me. I'm going to save that and go ahead and preview. Let's see basically if this is going to work. So our preview has loaded and how old are you? I can go here and type, let's type something like 200. If I press enter, you can see that we have our error message out of range, but if I type anything less than 100, I get to uh, I, I get I do not get that error message. So this is basically how you add a validation rule to your questions. In the next section, we're going to talk about how we can deploy this on our mobile devices. So having defined our question items and skip logic and validation logic. We can actually say that we have finished developing this questionnaire. The next thing we'll have to deploy the form to our mobile devices. So to do this, the first thing that we do is um, make sure that you have saved the form. So to know that the form has been saved, we'll see the message down here, successfully updated. Perfect. And then you go ahead and click the close button next to the save button, like so. So um, this is our um, form project. We have 17 questions, perfect to find. So the next thing we want to do is to go ahead and click deploy. So we have to give it a moment to deploy. And once it says deployed form, it means that the project has been deployed. We should be able to enter data on mobile devices. Now, entering data is not only done on mobile devices. Before I head to the mobile devices, 
I want to show you that you can enter data in different ways. Um, scrolling down to the collect data section of this page, when I click the drop down, you see that we have several options that of course include the Android application. So we can enter the data using this method called online offline for multiple submissions. If we have paper forms and you would like people to simply type in the paper forms that have been collected um, or you are in the field and uh, you're using the computer to enter your uh, data. So the advantage of using this method is that once the data has been entered, you don't really need to have internet connection. You, the data will be saved in your browser up until you are going to have internet. Even if you close the browser, actually the data still um, gets um, to be saved in the browser. Then online only, multiple submission means that uh, it's not going to be saving any data. But um, once the data has been entered, it will automatically go to the database. Then you can uh, do online only single submission, which is um, great for sending the form to other people so that they can enter that information and uh, send to you. So if you want people to answer or respond to this questionnaire on their own or, or um, what is known as um, um, what is known as self-administered forms, right? And then we also have embedded web form code, which will allow you to um, have some code that you can add on your website if you want people to ask, uh, to respond to your questionnaire off of your website. You have view only, which is similar to simply previewing. You can send a link to people, simply preview and send you feedback. And lastly, we have now the option for Android application, which is uh, basically, I'll just click that, which is um, a matter of installing an, 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 um, installing an app called Kobo Collect and then configuring the app to connect with our mobile, I uh, will connect with our um, account on Kobo2box.org and download the form and then we should now be able to go ahead and enter data from there. I'm going to show you how to do that in just a moment. But right now, let me just show you the online offline option. When I select that and go ahead and click open, it's going to open in a new browser. It's going to look really familiar right now because it's something that we have already seen, especially when we are previewing. So right now you can say, all right, so the first person is Mr. Peter Banda is a male. He's um, um, let's see, 25 years old. And um, household details, there are two people in the household. They do um, sorry and uh, other. They also get remittances from someone in South Africa. And um, they own some land. It's just one piece of land, uh, which is 0 0.25 hectares, and that's agricultural land. And then... The latitude and longitude, I'm just going to click this. It's going to, uh, as you can see, it is calculated using the internet, which is perfectly fine. And we'll finish that. I'll go ahead and click submit. Once it does that, it says the record has been queued for submission. And you can see one here. And it should automatically send that. As you can see, my project one has been successfully submitted, which means I'm ready for to actually go ahead and enter um, more uh, data here and it's gonna be synchronizing with the database if I'm online if I'm offline it will just keep the data in the browser once I get online that data is gonna be sent over to Cobo 2 box so right now when I, if I go to Cobo 2 box and um, refresh the page you see that now we have one submission and we also have this tab called data. All right, I'm gonna show you this data tab in a moment, but for now, that's how you enter data using the web browser. First of all, how that's how you deploy and how you can actually enter data just using the browser. 
now in the next lesson, I'm going to show you how to configure your mobile devices for data collection and how you can enter the data and send it over to the Cobo Toolbox platform. So in this lesson, we're going to talk about how you can configure your mobile devices to start collecting data. The first step you're going to take on a mobile device is going to um, Play Store. And on Play Store, you're going to search for an app called Cobo Collect. So then once you find Kobo Collect, which is the app that we have right now here, you're going to go ahead and install it. I already have it installed. That's why it says open here. So I'm just going to go ahead and open it. The next thing that you do once uh, you have installed and opened Kobo Collect is to go on the, uh, on the menu on your top right and then go to general settings. From general settings, you go to server. All right, so we are going to define three things. The first thing is the URL, then the username and the password. So I press um, on the URL. So the URL says https colon slash slash dot kc dot cobotubox.org slash. Now, the, what we have on the right hand side of the forward slash is actually the username. So what I have to do here is to just delete the other part, the last part, and put my username. Press OK. And um, on the other part, where it says username, you also go ahead and type your username. Then where it says password, you now go ahead and um, add uh, the password. Right. So go back, then back again. Then we're going to go ahead and select Get Blank Form. So right now what we're trying to do is trying to see if we have any forms that were deployed from the system and then we're gonna download those forms so we can start that entry so let's just um, wait a bit so now it has uh, listed all the forms that i have that were de deployed so what i have to do is to make sure that i have selected my project so the one that we're working on is my project that one is checked, then I'll go ahead and say get selected. Success, which means now this form is um, available. So the next thing you do is go ahead and say fill blank form. Select the form that you would like to enter data on. And as you can see, we have the form active and we can go ahead and enter data. I'm just gonna go ahead and say, okay, my name is Alexander. I'm obviously male. And uh, I am um, 29 years old. Uh, yep, I'm married. And how many people are in my household? I have six people in my household. Um, I do business. I do not own land. Okay, let me just say I own land right now. So I own land. Then um, I want to specify the details of each piece of land. It's going to ask um, to add a group, all right, which is basically one record of land. I'll say yes, add group. So I have 0 0.5 hectares, which is agricultural land. It's going to ask for another group. Yeah, I want to enter the 0 0.3, which is non-agricultural land, which is um, where my house is. Do you have more land? No, we don't. I'll say do not add. And the next thing is record GPS. I'll say start geopoint. And uh, since I'm inside of the building in my office, um, it's going to be really hard for us to take really decent GPS right now. It says, okay, I think this is perfect. So 6.43 meters, that's okay for me. I'm going to go ahead and save geopoint. So I have my latitude, longitude, altitude, and accuracy. Then I swap left. Then I'm at the end of the project. I very much recommend that to name the project. So for example, I would name it with my name, like so, and send form, save form and exit. Once you do that, it means you have filled in the form. The next thing you would do is to go ahead and say, select send finalized form. 
pick the form. You can see now it has been named exactly like the way we named it. This is nice because then if you have so many different forms that you have to send, you'll be able to know which um, form belong, belongs to who or which respondent. So select that one and select send selected. So now we are uploading the data to back to the server. So upload result successful, it means the data is now back into the server. So in the next video, or in the next lesson rather, I'm going to show you now how we can manage the data that we have sent from our um, um, data collection uh, exercise. So now let's look at some of the data management functions that we have right into that right in the Cobalt Two Box platform. Right now, you have seen from the past two videos, we were able to enter some data using the browser. But in the previous lesson, we looked at how we can enter data using the mobile uh, device. So I'm gonna have to basically refresh this because I uploaded a few cases. Um, so we should have a few more submissions. All right, so we have five submissions, that's great. So when you're going to look at the data that you have, you go to the data tab. And the, on the data tab, we have five links on your left-hand side. The first one is a report. So we have an automatically generated report which runs every other um, variable or question that we have and plot it in, in, in frequency tables and also in charts. So you can see so far we had 60% um, males and 40% females and so on and so forth. So you get to basically look at all the variables that we had in the data set. Now, the next thing you can do is probably go to table. In table, you'll be able to see the data that we have entered, but in a table format. So as you can see, we have all this data in table format. Great stuff. The next thing is Gare. If, um, if we had chosen to have um, photo type of um, questions or videos or audios, then when you go to Gali, you actually find those things um, in here. Now, if you want to export your data for analysis in other programs, you go ahead and say downloads and then you click export. So you have to wait a, a moment so that it generates that exported file for you. All right, we have a generated exported file, it's here. You can go ahead and um, Click the download button. Yeah, it says, do you want to open or do you want to save? I'm just going to go ahead and open it so we can see how the data looks like in there. All right, while it's opening, all right, I think we should just leave it to open. So you can see this is the data that we have from our data set. For the questions that we are repeating, those have been put in a separate worksheet. As you can see here, this is for um, the, the, the number of hectares and type of use, and you can actually see that. For example, the first one is connected to the, okay, so parent index. The first one is connected to the second um, questionnaire, and, uh, and so on and so forth. All right, let's go back. Now, apart from this, you can also view your data on a map. So. Let's see if that's gonna load. All right, so as you can see, we actually have things quite accurate because this is actually where, where I am at the moment. So yeah, you have all five functions um, right within the Kobo T-Box platform.